Ani, Buzu, everyone. Welcome to Lakehead University's Indigenous Initiatives and the School of Social Work Speaker Series, Part 2. Anishinaabeg Mind, returning to whom we have always been, the application of Anishinaabeg knowledge within social systems with invited speaker and educator, Nicholas Deleary. Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. Lakehead Aurelia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, which include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Lakehead Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. Lakehead University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses and is committed to our relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. As a university educator, as a university and also a profession, being social work, that is committed to decolonization and pursuing reconciliation in a genuine and meaningful way, it's important for us to recognize the harm that educational and social work policies and practices have had and continue to have on Indigenous peoples. To this end, we must also be mindful of the legacy of settler colonialism and white supremacist logics that we have internalized as individuals, as a society and country. We therefore have a responsibility to challenge, disrupt and dismantle these colonial mindsets and make every effort to consistently prioritize and embody anti-colonial practices within all aspects of our personal and professional lives to reestablish balance and harmony in our interactions and within all relationships. As an educator, I acknowledge the unlearning and relearning that must take place and I will continue my efforts to decolonize and indigenize social work education and practice to the best of my ability. Wherever you are joining us from this evening, I encourage you to also reflect on the colonial history of this nation, the continued strength and resilience of Indigenous people, and the responsibility and commitment we respectively have to advance reconciliation and maintain good relations with Mother Earth and all of creation. Miigwetchen, thank you to all of you as well for, to, for attending tonight's event. My name is Dr. Anita Allencourt, and I'm a faculty member in the School of Social Work, and I'm also teaching the Social Work 4411 course, Social Work Practice and Indigenous Peoples this semester. This speaker series is a collaboration between Indigenous Initiatives and the School of Social Work via this course uh, that came about for the purpose of extending the learning occurring in our institution to the community while also recognizing the important role and contributions that the Indigenous community can play to advance social work education and post-secondary education as a whole. It is our aim, as it's our aim, to provide post-secondary educational opportunities that foster greater understanding of Indigenous culture and wellness. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Nicholas Deleary. Nicholas Deleary is an Anishinaabe, Badawatomi, Ojibwe, Otomi. He is a longtime member of the Three Fires Medewin Lodge, a recognized Medewin teacher, a lodge and pipe chief. Nicholas is a registered band member of the Chippewa of the Thames. Before we begin, I'll allow, uh, I'll welcome Nicholas to the floor here and he can uh, provide you with some more details about himself. And also just a reminder that there will be a Q&A session following uh, Nicholas's presentation. At that time, we're going to ask participants uh, our participants will be able to ask questions. And for those who are joining us virtually, they can submit their questions through the Q&A option. Miigwech and welcome, Nicholas. It's been a while since I've uh, been back here up on the uh, lecture podium. And uh, so it's going to take a bit of getting used to here. And my coffee has arrived. My partner, his uh, beautiful partner, is bringing in my coffee. Didn't have time to, uh, to get the coffee. Um, so um, my real name is Megizzi Winini. Up there it says on the, uh, the big, big screen thing. And uh, uh, I have an English name. My English English name is Nicholas. 
and uh, miigwech. Um, and I belong to the uh, Loon clan, and uh, we're we're probably one of the. Um, we're also known to be very humble clan, and uh, also very handsome. Just, just kidding. <laughs> Lighten up. It's a Wednesday in the middle of the week. Um, so I'm honored to be here and to do this, uh, to do this work and to uh, come back here to the podium. Uh, I spent uh, quite a few years doing this. I began uh, lecturing back way back many years ago. I think the flock of seagulls were um, popular back way back then. Uh, as well as the Sex Pistols and the Ramones. Uh, so it's been a while since I've been uh, been teaching, but I, I was doing this full time. I've taught <clears throat> close to uh, six, over 6,000 students in my career. And I, in, in the later part of my career, I was uh, fed, fed up with the universities and colleges. So I moved to, uh, to uh, Toronto, I taught high school and uh, fell in love again with teaching and the reasons why I went, went into teaching. And so um, that's a little bit of what I have done. Let me see the next slide here. Uh, so uh, we're going to cover some things like indigenous knowledge, Western European knowledge. Uh, we're going to uh, get onto a subject called returning, returning to our minds our indigenous minds and then our ancestors' legacies and a little bit of imprinting on what epigenetics means to us. So I'm going to try to, uh, next slide. Not my transition not working there. Okay, so who am I? Uh, you heard a little bit of who I am. I am a uh, Ojibwe Otome. Uh, Otome are from central Mexico. As we get this out of there, I'm breaking it. There. Okay, I'm uh, Ojibwe Anishinaabe Otome. Otome are from central central Mexico. That's where my mother is from. My father is from here on this side of the Great Lakes, the Canadian. So I have my uh, official status card, and I am an Indian. Some of you are being taught to call us indigenous, uh, First Nations, uh, I'm an Indian. That's what the card says. Section 9124, I'm legally bound to be an Indian. So that's what they want to call me. So I use that when I, when I do my Indian work for the government. But, um, you know, so there's all these terms. Uh, what else? Um, I'm a survivor of academia. I never... Uh, published any books. Uh, I was very fortunate when I first went to university that we were under Jesuit University College in Sudbury at Laurentian and the old Jesuits told us in our department, don't write, don't write anything, don't do any papers, don't do any books, don't do anything until you've reached the age of maturity. Way long past uh, uh, your university academic career then you can begin to sit down and write write your papers because after a while uh, you'll assimilate all that knowledge you'll put the knowledge together you'll gather that knowledge and you don't have to worry about your job most faculty at universities are worried about jobs publishing or perish the whole publishing perish paradigm you're doing is just cranking out paper after paper for half-baked ideas so the jesuits were smart wait till you get older and mature, and you brought all this information together, and then write about it later. Uh, what else do I do? I'm a grandfather. I have 10 beautiful grandchildren. I have one great granddaughter, and she's uh, three, going on three and a half, I believe. Anyway, I have a whole pile of them. And uh, what else? I'm an artist, some of my artwork there, some uh, jewelry, some paintings, and uh, one of my illustrations on the uh, Ontario license plate. Um, so I'm an artist at the same time. I practice that. It's, uh, I have to force myself to do artwork. 
to get out of uh, projects and things like that. So I, I spend time doing that. Um, my partner, I just moved up here to uh, uh, Rama area and uh, living here now in Rama with my beautiful partner. And I'm happy she can join me here to, uh, to uh, participate in this, uh, this uh, lecture here. One of the big things that I'm really much, very much interested in and uh, working on is language preservation, language preservation, promotion, retention, and uh, I am continuing to learn my own language and uh, then uh, the culture loss, loss of our culture. Um, I don't believe in uh, reconciliation. Uh, I think it's a farce, and even though my good friend Murray will tell me otherwise. Um, but reconciliation, I don't really subscribe to that, and I'm not resilient. <laughs> I'm just here. <laughs> In a sense, I'm doing what I do. Um, so, next slide here. So, uh, a very dear friend of mine, um, when I first began teaching at university, was Dr. James Dumont. And he lives not very far from here, maybe about uh, 30 minutes away in Barrie. And uh, he is uh, still very much active, not as much as he used to, but he's a very dear friend of mine. And I've known him for uh, many years. Once I first graduated from Trent University, uh, I was picked up by the University of Sudbury Department of Native Studies. And I began my uh, teaching academic career at that place. I guess my academic career began earlier because I was at Trent University. Back then, we called it Indian Studies. See, so we've never gotten really lost. Uh, we've never deviated from the term. We're still Indians. Uh, at Indian Studies at Trent University and at Lakehead and University of Sudbury, Laurentian. So uh, Jim um, says some really interesting things in this paper that I presented to you for your reading, your consumption. And I know you didn't probably want to get another paper to read before the end of the term, but uh, nonetheless, uh, if you had a chance to look at it, the very first uh, paragraph would be really useful to read. Intelligence has been defined for us through the eyes of Euro-American psycho psychological scientific community. Its definition is limited to its application and understanding. What we have been pursuing as indigenous people since our involvement in education in the contemporary experience is attempting to measure up to the definition of intelligence. To be productive as they are, as successful as they are, to be intelligent as they are, and in doing so we have lost the encompassing nature of our definition of intelligence, indigenous intelligence. Whether it's the name of providing an economic base, pioneering some great invention, or furnishing a breakthrough in, for the future, if our use of our knowledge and our approach disturbs and disrupts the balance and harmony the life around us, it cannot be considered an intelligent act according to the indigenous standards of intelligence. So then why are we messing up all the water? Why are we taking out all the oil? Right? It goes right to the central core of modern day society. The so-called sciences, our economies are based on extraction of oils and minerals and the timber. Why are we leaving your grandchildren with no oil? Why are we polluting the air? Why are we polluting the rivers, the very water that we need to drink? So these are, these are challenging questions. And for us, the, in, in the indigenous world, and I can show you countless, countless examples of uh, indigenous uh, leadership back in the 17th century, the materials that were written during the 18th century, we said the exact same words as those that are up there in different ways. We consider the Europeans adolescents. Okay, the science, the technology of Europeans were considered adolescents. 
and the language was the adolescence language. And that we considered ourselves not just the Ojibwe, the Haudenosaunee, the other communities, the other nations in this country, basically all said the same thing. Our European brothers are like adolescents. They're playing at this, this world. And uh, how can you destroy something that's the very source of your life, namely Mother Earth? Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, dear friend that I only got to meet once, but was my hero when I was an undergraduate, was uh, Dr. Vine Delorier, a Sioux man from uh, Rosebud Sioux, South Dakota. And he said, basically, he's talking about the uh, Western European philosophy. The fallacies that Alfred North Whitehead identified within the Western philosophical tradition was the belief that principles of philosophy were clear, obvious, and irrefutable, irreformable, excuse me. Okay, that's the philosophy of Western European knowledge and science. That it's clear, that's obvious, and irreformable. He goes on further to say that science and technology reign today as the practical gods of the modern age. They give us the power to disrupt nature, but little real insight into how it functions. That comes from a book called uh, Spirit and Reason, 1999, if you're interested. It's good reading, you should read this material. These are the early, early professors of indigenous studies. Uh, when I was just an undergrad, at a time when there was only less than, I think when I first went to university, there was less than 200 of us enrolled at university. And then it you know, blossomed beyond that and it went, went, uh, went crazy for a while. So uh, what we did in Native Studies was uh, pioneering work. I was part of a, uh, I grew up in Michigan, in Detroit. My mother is from Mexico. I grew up in a Mexican ghetto in Detroit. And I was a member of the uh, Brown Beret and La Raza. I don't know if you know what those are. Uh, the brown, brown uh, indigenous music, indigenous, um, the uh, Brown Beret and the La Raza movements were the largest union, indigenous union in the world and continues to this day to be the largest labor indigenous movement in the United States and elsewhere. We were protesting a lettuce and grapes and things produced by the local farm workers in the United States, calling for better wages, health care, blah, blah, blah. But it was a large labor organization movement. So people like uh, Cesar Chavez and uh, Vicky Carr and others were kind of like household name for me when I grew up. And then, uh, so I grew up on the campus. I grew up at Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Ypsilanti campus, Ann Arbor. Um, so I played in the halls while my mother was going to school. So I uh, kind, of, kind of fell into it naturally. Next slide. Okay, so number one, one of the, the main principles that we've learned over the years is that indigenous knowledge does not exist in the schools of academia. So if you're coming here, I don't know if there's anybody out there going to study indigenous studies or come to school here to learn about uh, indigenous culture, history and that, you won't necessarily find it here, not in these academic halls. Um, and there's a good reason for that. You might find that you might go to the E99 section in your local library here. You'll find E99s, E98. E97, all the way up to 2000, I believe, full of ethnographies and stories and collections of materials in the library. At the bigger libraries, like at Western, like I used to live in London last year, uh, I'd go up there occasionally and there's like three or four rows of Indian section, the Indian books, <laughs> that where the primitives live in the library. 
So that's what, you know, they, you can actually walk in there and you can find the books on the primitive savage of North America, E99s in particular. So uh, indigenous knowledge, what is termed indigenous knowledge does not exist there. There's some useful information. That's about it. And I'll get to talk about those a little later on. Um, I can't remember what DNE stands for. Anyway, Indian Affairs doesn't exist. Uh, Indian Affairs knowledge. Yes, they have a lot of knowledge. They've collected massive amounts of data, information, but it still doesn't really say where indigenous knowledge exists. So you can go to the main library in Ottawa and go to a big, huge file, almost the whole floor, called RG10. So the government conveniently put all RG10 documents, all Indian documents, on one big floor. A massive, massive archive, a historical archive. So they would measure things like brains, brain sizes, teeth, all kinds of stuff was put in there because somebody was recording all this information and all this data can, is composed there in uh, RG10, what's called RG10. And, uh, but again, indigenous knowledge, I'm not sure if indigenous knowledge exists there. There's a lot of data and it's a lot of useful data. Like you would find files at RG10 about how, how the early father of the Canadian food guide the great wise doctor, um, you can look this up, there's a doctor who produced the first food guide. He practiced on the children at the residential school. So he practiced uh, seeing how much calories they can sustain their body over a period of time. So that's how he come up with the 2000 mark calorie guide. So that, that those files exist on RG10. And you can, go, you can go find them yourselves if you ever want to look at that stuff. Um, so it doesn't exist there. In a cloud, we're not sure yet exactly what a cloud is. It, it, you know, you got this, this thing hanging up there in the sky, and you have a bunch of data up there, and you got a kite string that leads up to that, that, that cloud. So we're still kind of not sure, does, our, the, does indigenous knowledge exist there? For sure, though, for sure, it exists with the language speakers and those practitioners of, practitioners of culture uh, the, and who are tied you know, very closely with a lot of the elders. The, the challenge we're facing, and specifically with the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe people, is that we are, uh, well, a majority of the speakers that we have left are in their 70s. And so we're in a really, even though, even though it might say on Google or someplace like that, if you go look it up, uh, we have like 30,000, 40,000 speakers. We, we don't think we do. So we're trying to get accurate reading on where we're at currently with the numbers of speakers, the numbers of speakers who then have a higher, uh, there's all kinds of levels of speakers. You have an everyday speaker, somebody who just goes to the gas station and they talk in a language. You have teachers, a very few limited group of teachers who have been teaching the language for a number of years, so they're applying that knowledge. And then there's ceremonial leaders, again, a very small group of people. So we need to uh, get the numbers on the language loss and culture loss, because it's just uh, going more rapidly than we could ever imagine. And some of us fear the worst. But it's a, it's a nightmare that a number of us continue to live with, uh, that loss of the language and loss of our culture. So uh, most importantly, though, it in, it, the indigenous knowledge uh, thrives and continues to uh, be with us. And I'm going to push it here, the envelope, a little bit. It, it, it survives through our epigenetic modeling through the epigenetic coding. So that every child that is born uh, already has the language. So you're like, you'll hear often that we're losing our language, we've lost our language, but uh, modern scientists tell us that it takes four to five generations 
for us to really lose our language. So we haven't reached that number yet. We're not at the fourth generation. We're getting close, getting close. We, we have uh, some communities where I come from where there's very few language speakers left. We have other communities where there's still language speakers. Like here in Rama, just across the lake there, there's you know a sufficient body of speakers. But again, uh, they're not all active, but there is speakers left. And uh, here we are in southern Ontario. So further north you go in some communities, there's more speakers. And again, there's all types of various levels of speakers left. So <clears throat> what I'm here to describe and to talk about is how we've been activating our minds, the indigenous minds. Um, one of my drawings there, in the big upper right, your left side, this is a, a, an Ojibwe Anishinaabe scroll that sits at the uh, uh, Museum of Man, not Man, Museum of Civilization Meeting Museum in Ottawa. It's part of what is called the Reagan Collection. This, this story that's pictured here, by the way, just to let you know how our indigenous minds work, is uh, over 500 years old. They did the radiocarbon dating on these particular scrolls. And uh, this one here is um, would hang this way. So one part would be on the ground and the other part is vertical. It's a picture writing system that the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe Anishinaabe had perfected. And we've been utilizing this for well over 2000 years. Pictographic writing on birch bark. It's a writing system. It doesn't have to be Roman orthography to be a writing system. You can have three-dimensional, you can have mats, you can have woven blankets, buffalo hides, carvings, all kind of writing systems exist in the world today. Roman orthography is relatively new. So there's other means of writing. So the Anishinaabe have a writing system that's very old. That one describes a migration it describes a migration. The reason I can talk about this is because it's public domain knowledge sitting in a museum. So here's the eastern coast, the Great Lakes, Waiatanong, where I'm born, center of the universe. Just kidding. <laughs> Lighten up. Lake Huron and Lake Superior over here. It's a, it's a migration story, a movement of governance and social cultural movement across the land uh, beginning about 2000 years ago. So it's in picture form. We have a written language. You'll hear people say that we didn't have a written language. Next slide, please. So um, I like this quote here uh, in uh, 1820. Uh, George Sibley, who was an Indian agent for the Osage people, Osage are central, north central Oklahoma. And they were displaced numerous times, but they eventually settled there in Oklahoma. Um, he was trying to convince this chief called Big Soldier to give up everything of being Osage and become white or a white brown man. <laughs> and this was his reply. He said, uh, I see, I see and admire the manner of your li of living, your good warm houses, your extensive fields of corn, your gardens, your cows, oxen, workhouses, wagons, thousand machines that I know not the use of. I see that you're able to clothe yourselves, even from weeds and grass. In short, you can do almost what you choose. You whites possess the power of subduing almost every animal to your use. You are surrounded by slaves. Everything about you is in chains and you are slaves yourselves. I fear if I should exchange my pursuits for yours, I too will become a slave. That's 1820. So we're, uh, 
we've been saying these things. <laughs> we've been saying these things. We've been dissidents and, and radicalized and they've been decolonizing, <laughs> right? I, I'm not sure about the term decolonization. Um, I'm more like, I'm thinking just return to ourselves. And uh, decolonizing remains to me more like a commodity, means more like money kind of thing. So if we're just returning to ourselves, what we've always been, then it's not decolonizing. We're just saying what we've always been saying all along, that the modern European science technology is adolescence based. And that uh, we we have to do something seriously now as people, all to all of us, because we don't have too much longer. We're going to destroy the very planet that we live on. So how intelligent is that? Next slide, please. So um, just to, just to kind of refamiliarize yourselves with linear thinking. How many of you uh, have do linear thinking? Probably most of you here at the university that we're, 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 we're stuck into this linear thought processes. The system of European knowledge defines and redefines itself. It's narrow, singular, myopic, perpendicular framework. Ultimately, it self-destructs. It's uh, a very clear, straightforward, logical progression of thought, myopia, or singular vision, one eye, that, that projects and motivates the whole scientific world. Um, it's intelligence, but uh, after a while, routine develops. So within that routine, uh, it becomes the accepted truth. Once the parameters of that log logical uh, thought process is set up, it just becomes routine. Nothing is uh, nothing becomes new. There's new knowledge, new innovation comes along slowly. So eventually intelligence, what we know as intelligence vanishes. Uh, in so doing, we agree that there are certain sets of presuppositions. So we we all agree that there's you don't rock the boat. Even for the faculty and the the prisoners, well, we'll say prisoners, <laughs> the professors at the university who are locked within the academic world don't rattle the boat too much. It, it, it's, it's just assumed that these presuppositions exist. And, uh, uh, you, you know, that we dare not question anything. But, you know, over time, people have begun questioning and questioning the very uh, roots of ac Western academia. And especially you begin to see this with the women's movement, the feminist movement. You get to see uh, radical changes in certain disciplines, sociology in particular, social work. So uh, a lot of these disciplines have been changing slowly and questioning the very values of academic world. When I was, when I was last teaching at the colleges, we lived in an area that was a very high population of Arabic and uh, Arabic speaking peoples in Windsor, one of the largest populations in, in southern Canada. And yet at the university and at the college, there was only two faculty who were Arabic, who spoke Farsi. So a number of us uh, radical academics got together, formed a committee, we looked at the numbers and we just said like, what's wrong with this picture? When the population that you serve right here in Windsor is not even being serviced. And the, uh, many of the students speak Farsi and speak other Arabic langu languages, you have two, not even full-time faculty. So you're not responding. The university just, ah, la, la, la. They went on and on and on about, you know, hiring policies, blah, blah, blah. It slowly changed. It took them, you know, like five or six years after we did the report. And then um, a number of us just got fed up with that and just left that. Just, it was just disheartening. 
So uh, some of the problems then that we've encountered with uh, European uh, sciences, social sciences in particular, this, this image here, by the way, comes from a textbook. <laughs> so every child that's taught in the Canadian universities or Canadian high schools and books across the country are still seeing images like this. I remember the last time I went to the ROM, which was about six years ago, there's a diorama like this, the buffalo and uh, Indian dudes out there with big rocks and spears going to take down the buffalo and uh, knock it out with a big, big piece of big rock or a big spear. And uh, museums abounded in these type of uh, panoramas depicting the big game hunters, the wild big game indigenous hunters. That's how we're portrayed. How could how could they? How could these uh, people running around the bush, half starving, half naked, have an intellectual philosophy? How could we know about the, all the planets and name them in, by name? This is what was told to us. Even when I went to school, argued with anthropological professors, same arguments. Um, and uh, it just raged on and on this type of uh, I think it's actually an abusive situation to go to a school and then be taught that that your people come from the Bering Straits. Your people never had the, the wheel, you never had the number zero, but yet I'll get into a leader, but yet we still uh, these are images that are being taught in the Canadian school system. They don't come right out and say that this is what's happening, but this is what the implicit images show and depict. Um, we have long established and known that uh, Western European sciences are in adolescence phase. They're just very small, very limited, unfortunately. Immaturity is, uh, immaturity is abundant, destroying the very planet that we live within. And is that intelligent? I keep asking, is that intelligence? And you have to question this as well. Is this intelligence to destroy the planet that we live on? Is it an intelligent way to be? So you're going to school. <laughs> if it's not, then let's do something about it. Let's change it. Let's get intelligent. Let's all get smart. Uh, European science throws out all the anomalies. So I did this little equation on the bottom, A equals B equals C, and then there's a bunch of messed up letters. So the anomalies. Now, in my culture, in my culture, we live for the anomaly. The anomaly is what makes life worth living, right? But in the, in the Western tradition, we know that you you supply uh, 10,000 uh, Tylenol aspirins to 10,000 people of that group, half of them get a placebo, half of them get better with the placebo. So the anomalies are tossed out, right? They don't know what to do with the anomalies in the, in the science labs. There's anomalies all the time. So the anomalies are tossed out. Let's just deal with the facts, straight facts straight data. Next slide, please. So Anishinaabe data, the data that we have been composing and collecting for many years, uh, we see the, uh, the fallacy of expansion, of European expansion as a great and courageous thing. It's portrayed in that way. Last weekend was Thanksgiving in the United States. How many ever go to the States to see the Thanksgiving? all the stuff that's there. They got the Pilgrim Fathers, the great Pilgrim Fathers, sitting down to have dinner with the Indians, a few Indian dudes with a bunch of feathers on their heads. But if you actually know what happened in that story, Squanto, the guy who celebrated the first Thanksgiving, went over to Europe, was an indentured servant, a slave, bought his way out of that slavery, bought a ticket back to the States, came back about 10, 15 years later to his home community, in Connecticut, and what did he find? He found all his family dead, 
his whole community dead by disease. So he had no choice but to eat dinner with those other guys. And that was the great American Thanksgiving. So the fallacy, it's a fallacy. The sooner you wake up to the lie that they've been feeding you, the better, better off you're going to be. We got to wake up. So Western economy, the great economy that has built this world is also a fallacy. It's based on slavery and based on prisoners. We can't get away from, we can't deny it. Uh, so the early land speculators, like the great Talbot, like down in Southern Ontario, George Talbot, I believe, he's got monuments all over the place, Ryerson. <laughs> There's all kinds of monuments all over the country of these great, great chauvinists who were land speculators, stealers of land, and very wealthy people, became very wealthy as a result of land speculation. In fact, this whole land here used to belong and still does, I think, belong to the people of Rama, who were swindled out of their homeland and forced to move across where they couldn't grow anything on the rocks. And then there's, you know, we don't want to go on, there's a lot of things <laughs> in the area here, but well, that's just one little example of, the, uh, of land stealing. So the founding fathers of both, uh, were both slave owners, thieves, and wealthy land speculators. So after, in Canada, present-day Canada, after we go back about 35 years, just in the Canadian law system, legal tr tradition, every success of government, whether they're the suit of Gucci, of Trudeau, or Tommy Hilfiger, all the suit guys go back every year after year and get a new reading from the court on Aboriginal title. Why? The courts have ruled over and over and successfully over and over again. Aboriginal title exists. You have to deal with these people. That's what the courts say. You must deal with them because one, they own the land. Three quarters of Canada has never been transferred into British Crown. So you got to deal with them. You got to work with them. They own the land. They own the waters, for sure. In my community, we live along the Thames River, 15 minutes from Lake Erie, 40 minutes from Lake Huron, and all the water that connects those two great bodies of water. We've never signed any of the water away. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, geez, we could bottle that stuff up and sell it. Even if, we could, even if we could sell it at $30, 30 cents a bottle, we'd still make a killing. Um, anyway, so I'm just thinking there's, you know, some economic development projects to get us out of the destitute state. Anyway, so um, the land mass of Canada is, is still in question, but the courts, the Supreme Court has ruled Indigenous people who are here still own the land. And that's the big challenge. But it's a big challenge. I don't know how we're going to resolve it. Probably with lots of presents and gifts to each, each other. Lots of feasts, lots of dancing, and maybe some ceremonies. And probably lots of cash. We've been telling the Canadian government, I began once I was an undergraduate, uh, after my first successful dismal first year at university. I barely eked out uh, a D grade, uh, but nonetheless, I was still there, still involved. Uh, you know how you can get socially involved in your first year. That kind of happens to a lot of students. So uh, that happened to me. So I barely made my first year, but uh, that summer then I worked for my own community and began a project of research on the Mount Algon Residential School one of the first uh, Indian residential schools in Canada, uh, situated in my community. There was only three of them that were put into the internal workings of the community. Mount Elgin was the first one, 1846, I believe. 
So we have known, and we have been saying this for years, but nobody would listen. The government wouldn't listen. Our own bank council wouldn't listen. The elders that I worked with to gather all the stories surely knew this. We know exactly where the graves were. We've been saying this for years. The records that we obtained through the research from the church indicated that there were graves. We've been saying this for years. Why all of a sudden? That's the question I ask. Why all of a sudden does the government acknowledge that there's these graves in the in the in uh, in, the, in, the, in these res uh, reserve schools? So somewhere in there, there's a something's something's going wrong. <laughs> there's a there's a cover up. Uh, uh, next, thank you. So, uh, very few, uh, very few, and brave academics will venture into the indigenous area. I have a good friend at Trent University. He began research with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He went through all kinds of security briefings. It took him six months to just clear all the security and all the. Uh, the psychological test that he had to take and all the clearance from the federal government to do this type of work. And what he basically found out, just read at RG10, was that this guy who wrote the Canada Food Guide practiced on the kids at the school. Starve them, give them vitamins, see what happens. At my school, at my reserve school, we had a barn. When we were kids, we used to play there. There was this big barn, and inside the barn was these stacks and stacks of these boxes uh, wrapped up in this brown paper stuff. So we broke into them because nobody were, was there to look after us. We broke into the boxes and found these square things about this big, about that thick, about that wide, and they're kind of like a cell phone. You could actually whip them at each other and we had wars with them and they wouldn't break this is what this guy was feeding the kids still left in the barn after years some kind of uh, nutritional neutral grain bar that's where i'm sure neutral grain came from but they added fruit in between and called it like an oreo or thing but these was what they gave to the kids and uh, I found out through research that the community members called them dog biscuits. And the, the laugh was because even the dogs who, who will eat most anything on the reserve, uh, oatmeal and all kind of, whatever is left over, that, that's their food, uh, the dogs won't even eat those things. That's how bad they were. So, um, so there's been a few academics over the years to dwell into indigenous knowledge and to actually work with us but they've been cast out the moment you start to say something about the fallacy you get tossed out so what is it that we're rejecting we systematically reject the artificial forcing of nature to tell us about herself got it some lab somewhere some guy some professor, man or woman, I don't know who, is forcing nature, forcing her, Mother Earth, to conform and to comply with their limited science understanding. So we reject that. You can't take the nature out of the nature. She exists out there on the land, on the earth, in the waters, the rocks, the, the trees. She exists. All you have to know, just leave an open mind. She exists and you don't have to think beyond that. Once you start working with her, it changes the whole perspective. And so this is a, a I, I would imagine you could say a lot about how uh, women are treated in one society to another society. Western science, uh, prematurely derives its laws as the final obvious. 
It's how the universe operates. Isn't it obvious that Western science is the only science? Right? That's what we hear all the time. Science is going to save us. The technology is going to save us. It's the only science. It's the only science of the whole universe. There's no other science. It's the only science. It's the supreme science of the world. And in fact, the cosmos, everything operates like that. And we're just saying, no, <laughs> there's another way to see this. So we are rejecting out of the box or within that box, we reject that there's, uh, there's only one science in the whole world. That's not true. That's a fallacy. There's many sciences. Our particular science, our particular form of science for indigenous peoples lives and thrives with anomalies, with what you would call spirit or heart or emotion. Things that, you know, like Einstein said, things that uh, are spooky at a distance, right? You ever have those kind of things? Intuitions? Spooky things that happen in nighttime, things that happen at a distance, the anomalies. Well, in our culture, we live for those. We, we cherish them. We, we, we can't wait till we have one, <laughs> an anomaly. So um, this uh, is in Ohio. This is the Great Serpent Mound. Now, the way that we're portrayed by the scientific community is these people who are running around the bush, half starving, half naked. If you read any section of E99, you read E99, E98s, particularly about the Ojibwe Chippewa people who live here. They called us big game hunters. They, they said that we basically, basically could, uh, are, are just on the brink of, of starvation. And that this caused us to have all these types of beliefs about the Wendigo spirit, all kind of things like that. But what they really never tell you is, well, if we're living here in the Great Lakes, who the hell built these things? <laughs> so go to, go to uh, Ohio, still Anishinaabe territory. Go to Peterborough, go on the south side of Peterborough, and there's a Great Serpent Mound there. A small one, not as big as this one. But mathematically, how do you take how do you take this one here? So in the star world, you have these stars. You have this big dipper up there. And you have these other constellations that have been coming up for thousands and thousands of years. So how do you take those stars and put them onto the earth? and then make a big mound in exact alignment with those stars and planets. So you wake up one morning, <laughs> you woke up, you, you next to your partner, hey, I had this dream, this amazing dream. We're gonna build a big friggin' uh, serpent mound over there. We're gonna employ people for about 10 years. They're gonna carry basket loads of earth and we're going to make this serpent mound. We're going to use that big, that, that center of that door over there. And we're going to use the center of this thing here. We're going to put that line right down the middle. Now it'll be the first line. Right. right there, we're going to put that one like that. And we'll use the other line that way. So how do we take up there what we see as observable data and bring it to the earth? How do we do it? Anybody know? You're all social workers, social scientists, psychologists. Come on, somebody knows. You need to have pi. Remember high school? You need to have pi in your mathematics. Okay, so you, in order to take what's up there, observable data, the stars, the movement of the planets, the elliptic of the sun, the moon, you need to take that stuff and bring it onto the earth. Because you're not going to use that big tree over there or the corner of that doorway that you use as your first sight line 
you want to be bang on. On the equinox, on the solstice and so on, you got to be bang on. So you need to have pi. The only way to get pi, the only way, I don't know, I don't care what mathematics you use, binary or uh, 10, 10 based mathematics. I like, I like binary math, my and binary math. You need zero. You need a zero to get to pi. Now, why don't you go back to that couple of screens earlier where there's the big mammoth hunters with the big rocks, bad hair day dudes. How did they invent pi? Right? That's what we're told, right? Those guys who are hunting the woolly mammoths over there, they could never have invented pi. They don't even know how to use. They have the most primitive looking rocks. And they're taking down woolly mammoths with stones. But yet, somebody built these, must have been aliens. Or, I don't know, Egyptians or somebody come along and somebody come along and built these things. And they used pi to put it all together. Well, we've had pot, we've had zero in our mathematics for maybe 2000 years. We've had zero in our mathematics uh, written in stone in Central America for at least 2000 years. We know that it's confirmed over and over again. It's written in rock. How can you build a gigantic pyramid of stone without having mathematics? You don't employ thousands of people and just say, well, we'll just put it here. Well, maybe we'll go three feet this way instead. Or maybe we'll go 10 feet that way. We have to be exact in order to build something like that. And you need zero. And you need pi. And you need a bunch of other calculations. So um, I'm just put that there because in indigenous intelligence, indigenous intelligence is far superior in the modern day world. Uh, next slide, please. What time is it? Anyway, I gotta time myself. Anybody see the time? Okay, so I gotta get moving then. Um, this is Cahokia, another great Anishinaabe city. Population of around 200,000 at the time of European invasion. 200,000 people living there peacefully, okay? Bigger than Paris. Next slide, please. Um, separate mounds, I covered them. I'll move, next slide, please. So uh, how do we return to ourselves? This is a big question. Here's uh, Serpent Mounds near Peterborough. You take a look at this this uh, progression right there. That's the elliptic, the sun's elliptic. Bang right on, dead on. You can't mistake it. It's about 1,500 years old. Um, so the grounding that we need to look for, the, the source of indigenous knowledge to return to ourselves is to return to our language. It's always been there. It's not going to be found in the universities, unfortunately. Well, they help. You get a good job, get a good retirement. But for most of us, we need to return to our language. It's the source of who we are. It's the source of uh, our vision, the source of our knowledge, the source of our knowing. It's through our language and cultures. We can't measure up to become European. It's just not possible. It's, it's a limited science as far as we're concerned. So in our language, some rocks are alive. In Ojibwe, there's 4,500, 4, 5,000 verbs. English language has seven major pronouns. We have 22. And then the tail endings, you can, there's limited, um, many, 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 many um, words that we use. It's all verb-based. Our language is divided into animate and inanimate. Some rocks are alive. There's a way to determine that as well. Anyway, so, uh, and in terms of the academic world, and this is what bothered me the most, is that um, we have been struggling to put together our own accredited universities, 
colleges to meet our needs within our communities. But in the last few years, all the money the province has been shooting at us is going to hire VPs. So every major university has Indigenous VP or Indigenous Provost or a special Indigenous academic advisor. And then we have some universities building big buildings called the Indigenous Unit. Meanwhile, the Indigenous Institutes are struggling. We've been saying we want our own universities, we want our own places to teach and define the standards by which intelligence is measured by our own terms for well over 35, 40 years now. We've been saying this, saying this. Pretty soon the old faculty die off. Then we look around, we see Lakehead, we see Laurentian. Um, we see Western, we see Hamilton, we see all these universities in Ontario building up their Indigenous Studies programs. I'm not saying that it's bad, I'm just saying that Indigenous knowledge does not exist in the academic world. We should set our own terms. People in our own communities have bought into this and they ask us, well, how can we accredit our own people? Who's going to accredit our own people? We do. <laughs> we'll accredit our own people. Um, next page, please. So I'm just, uh, so this is what I'm, this is one of the main things that I've been talking about for a long time now. I continue to, to uh, people are probably getting sick of me talking about this, but we need our own academic institutions. That where, where we can take our young people and ground them in their language, in their philosophies, in their epistemologies. Once they get through that system, a BA or a BSW or whatever we want to call it, they can go on to university, mainstream university, but they need to be grounded first. Our own school systems are not grounding our children in their history. We're being taught a bifurcated, bicultural, bilingual lang sets of language and bifurcated, bicultural sets of uh, science. We can be using Anishinaabe science. It's far superior because <laughs> we, we keep the, all the anomalies and we still have scientific method. So I've I'm, I'm, um, been promoting this for some time now and continue to uh, support this and move and make this uh, become a reality. One of my missions in life. Uh, that's another scroll. Um, just by the way, this is uh, from Washington, so I draw these things. This is from the uh, Smithsonian, and uh, there are four colors of humankind that are brought down to the earth. That's one of them, one of the creation scrolls. It's public domain knowledge. How did a bunch of run around the bush, half naked, half starving people, know four colors that would be brought here to this place. Anyway, that's another story. That's a whole nother lecture. Next slide, please. And uh, lastly is uh, our epigenetic modeling. I wanted to cover that because that gets to the core of who we are. Uh, modern science has only come about within the ta last 10 to 12 years to, to finally say they never said this, though. I was waiting for it. All you uh, indigenous people in the Americas, you guys are like 50 years ahead of us because you've already said this and told us about ancestors. So modern psychology has just determined this within the last 10 years. It's finally making its way into university halls in the past three or four years. You carry all the genetic codes from your ancestors, each one of you. Handed down, you got four grandparents in front of you, eight great grandparents, 16 great great grandparents, and just goes on and on and on. All that genetic memory is passed on. So modern science, psychological science, has just confirmed this. <laughs> okay. And so then when we look at the culture loss, 
We've known this. We've been operating with these things. We use these things in our healing programs. Um, it's phenomenal. We, we can actually move young children. I work uh, off and on for the past 25 years as the uh, ceremonial um, and therapist at a, a treatment, youth treatment solvent abuse center, southwestern Ontario. So I just came back from a three or four day work there with the young kids and we tap into their epigenetic codes. We work with them, we work with their ancestors and work with them to find healing from drug addiction and cutting and all the other stuff that they're getting into. So uh, we know it works. We've been using these models for a long, long time. And in fact, in the Ojibwe language, we have names for all those things that you would find in DNA, not the mononucleoids and all those things like that. But we have names for the strands on the DNA code. We have uh, names for our ancestors. We've known about this and utilized that for a long, long time. So um, all this to say is that uh, um, you know, we're doing these things for ourselves. Oh, and you'll probably see Zaki and Facer, Facebook on there. So uh, the transmission is not found. I know that uh, a lot of people use Facebook and you can go onto the Anishinaabe sites and uh, see what's happening in Indian country, but um, they're kind of owned by the guy. Um, so, uh, uh, reconnecting to our ancestral past is primary, is key and primary, and nobody can do this for us. The church can't do it for us. Indian Affairs can't do it for us. This is just something that has to be done internally. And uh, I think we need time to do this. That's why I was, I'm, not, I'm not promoting reconciliation. Just send the cash to the churches. If you're interested in reconciling, send the cash first. After about 15 years of sending cash, massive amounts of cash, uh, the kids are going to figure out what to do with all the gifts. Because in our culture, when, you're, when you have a problem, you send the other family gifts. Horses, blankets, things like that, gifts. After some time, when there's enough gifts exchanged, then you can start to move towards reconciliation. That's just the way it works in our community. So if you hear of anybody wanting to send gifts, just send the gifts, send the money, and we'll figure out reconciliation maybe two generations away. So um, uh, that's my talk. I know it was, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. My email. And my website still under construction, so it's, does, it's not even operating. Uh, I was one of the. I was one of the first. I belong to the first department that created the first indigenous social work program. I wrote half of the curriculum, and then got it accredited. The idea there was is that we were going to move the curriculum from the university at Laurentian into the community. It was a three-way ownership. Robinson Huron Chiefs, our department, and Laurentian. But unfortunately, Laurentian took it off. So we were supposed to move it into the community. That was the idea, to take it outside the university and put it into the communities where it was needed. Same kind of social work, but we changed it much, much more dramatically. Anyway. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, any questions? That's a good question. Well, 
it's very obvious that most of you have all taken psychology, right? How many of you have taken psychology 101? Okay, great. What is it all about? The mind. Do you talk about emotions? Very little. Do you get to talk about um, trauma? Mm, a little bit. It's all it's all pretty it's pretty it's pretty well defined within a narrow box, correct? Do you talk about soul? No. You don't. Do you talk about dreams in modern psychology? No. So in our world, in my world, we have about 15, 13, 14, 15 categories of dreams. So I'm, I'm sitting there thinking today, I was looking at my computer, I'm doing this lecture, sitting there looking at it, and then this thing comes on, Google says, hey, you better buy a ticket because you missed the Tuesday night's draw. So I started dreaming there. Man, what would I do with that kind of money? <laughs> if I could win that money, if my lucky numbers could come in. So I'm, I'm in a dream state. It's a state of mind. It's a dream state, awakened state of mind. So dreams, uh, we have all these categories of dreams from everyday dream right to the top of the line, life shattering, earth changing, dream of a lifetime. We have names for each one of those dreams. So in our world, in our psychology, dreams are very important. They're the windows to the soul. You can't have a soul without having a body but the body only lasts for so long, as well as the spirit that dwells and activates the body. But the soul is the one that pushes the body. So the whole concept of soul, it's not talked about here. Where, where are you going to talk about it at the university? What course would you find to talk about the soul at the university? In the humanities, maybe in the, the religious studies section, right? They're not the real scientists though, right? That's the, the religious studies people over the fanatics at the University of uh, Toronto. What's the campus there? St. George's, yeah. yeah I, I went to that college. So that's where you get to talk about the soul, but in psychology, we don't talk about the soul. We don't talk about dreams. So very few universities have dream labs, but again, it's very technical within the limitations of the science. And so in our world, then the anomalies are dreams. How, much, how you know you have a dream in your you have a dream. A dream is like uh, going to the movies, right? Except you pay to go to the movies. You pay twenty, thirty dollars to go to the movies to see somebody that's ten feet tall when you can dream every night, when you can get to three or four dreams a night, when you get to instructional dreams, when you get to uh, dreams that are telling the future. So uh, that's just some example. There's, there's many more. Spirit is a big part of it. Spirit. We see the whole universe all connected in this massive web of spirit, of energy. So another anomaly, you don't talk about it in the science world. Good? Okay, thank you. Any more? I'll take maybe one or two more. The first question would be is would you consider native courses native language courses and introduction to ceremonies as a forward step to indigenous knowledge in academia no <laughs> they work i mean it's it's i think it's valid i think people need that i think people need to learn the discipline of that type of study of language within the university within post-secondary but is it going to save our languages? I don't know. I have serious doubts. Um, 
An example is in my community where I live, I live in three communities, Chippewa, the Thames, Muncie, Delaware, and Oneida. Oneida currently has 22 speakers left in the world. That's it. 22 speakers left of the language in the world of that particular language. Muncie, Delaware, which is on our side of the river, has zero language speakers left. The last one died last last month. And um, so I have a lot of relatives in the community. We've lived together for almost 200 years. And I know many of the language speakers who are speaking in Oneida at Oneida. I know a, a number of the language speakers at Muncie, Delaware. They went to school, they tried everything they could do to get their paperwork, to get the credentials, to become a linguist, a linguistic, to study their language, which they did. They got their degree, they attended courses, but it still didn't, it still, at the end of the day, it didn't matter. Because now Muncie, Delaware is without any language speaker. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to help our communities. Uh, by having university courses. Again, indigenous knowledge doesn't exist here. It doesn't exist here. Thank you so much. We have one more question online. Sure. Um, what would your solutions be towards introducing native knowledge to the Western Adolescent Mindset Institutes? More language or more ceremony as examples? No. My, uh, what I'm trying to say to the academic world is study yourselves. We have, we have rows and rows of books written about us, our thick skulls, our size of our brains, the size of the craniums, how many teeth we have, the, the way that our teeth structures are made, and on it goes, just vast amounts of data collected on us. And that um, it doesn't mean more ceremonies, we can't it's not going to make that much of a difference. We have to be given the freedom to validate ourselves in, in, in uh, knowing who we are first. The validation of us by ourselves, by our own people, understanding our language, knowing our language, preserving our language. Within the academic world, the academic world needs to question its abuser state. They're continuing to abuse our people. We've been demanding our own institutions for ourselves, by ourselves, accredited by ourselves for many years. And we're still nowhere near it. So academia has to change its thinking. It's not the only science. And once they begin to question that, then maybe they'll begin to understand we need to do something quickly, though. Anyway, thank you. Online, way in the back, yes. Okay. <laughs> Throw it, toss up a coin. So yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you for the talk and. Um, I think this talk is super important, especially when you're talking about language preservation. Um, I was gifted um, doing research on Vancouver Island, and one of the byproducts was that I ran into someone who was in my research, but he was one of the last surviving of the Sinemo language on Vancouver Island. So um, it's super important. So so thank you for for this talk. Um, my question is, um, besides language. I know you talked about a little bit of you know starting a school and um, having them um, defy intelligence. What in what way would you also want to define intelligence? What does intelligence mean to you um, in terms of uh, um, when you're opening up a school and stuff like that? So, just uh, yeah. Uh, I think what in terms of the language, you know how we have a beginner language and then all through the grades, we need to as uh, a community. Uh, begin to mobilize the language teachers, identifying the language teachers, the language elders, the language speakers, and begin to seriously 
have conversations with one another where we can articulate the very minor details within each step of learning a language. Uh, we've been modeling our programs based on uh, European bifurcation or bicultural linguistics. So what's happened then is that a, a small example is that in the dictionaries written by white men, they say this is a chair, but in our language, it's not a chair. It's just this object that you bend your body on and you sit on like that. So you could put a, a big rug on the floor and I can drag you on that and you're sitting on it and that becomes a chair. So I could put uh, wheels on it and pull you across the room. I could put an engine on it. And now that becomes a chair too. So um, uh, then in terms of the intelligence of our language, it's very sophisticated language. We're ranked as number eighth in the world, the world's most eighth, eighth most difficult language to learn in the world because of its structure. So then in terms of our intelligence, we see our intelligence is way we, it's huge <laughs> in order to be able to define how a person can sit this. I don't know how many ways you can identify snow. There's probably 300 ways you can identify snow. Uh, so there's the observable data, right? The observable data of nature and, and the land and people. So I'm really interested in how exactly that question is, how we translate that into the application of learning models than how we teach that. Right now, we're failing all of our children. Basic human right to teach the children in their language, to teach them their culture, we're failing it. We're, we're allowing this to happen ourselves. Our own schools, our own communities are allowing Indian Affairs to dictate these are the standards. Thanks. Good question. Okay. Sure. Hi, I was wondering, um, you mentioned doing epigenetic healing work, I think with children or youth. Um, and I was really curious about that and wondering if you could elaborate a bit on and what that looks like. Um. I, I developed a program at the colleges called uh, Traditional Aboriginal Healing Methods. One of the challenges that we face, it's a political question as well. Um, I believe that the government has called these programs healing programs. <laughs> and they give us vast amounts of money for healing programs. We got healing programs here, we got healing programs over there, we got organizations completely devoted to healing. And yet, uh, we're missing the boat again. It's the same thing of applying the indigenous knowledge based within the language, the actual healing within the language. So then, in our language, um, we talk to our ancestors. So when uh, these young children come into our care at the treatment center, they're, they're cutting, they're, they're on um, some of them on methamphetamine, and other uh, other types of drugs. Um, one of the first questions that we or I ask with the team, we have begin to ask them, well, do you have any dreams? Yeah, <laughs> I have dreams. Do I ha you have dreams about your ancestors? Yes. So that's the first signal then to begin that particular type of therapy. So then we start engaging with them in a more detailed way. We start asking more complex questions of them based on uh, what they're talking about, what their dreams are telling them. And sometimes it's real simple, sometimes it's more complex. And then we use a number of other, uh, what are called seers, uh, who work with the child to contact a certain member of their family, deceased. Thank you. Thank you. Is there somewhere um, that we could learn more about that? Maybe if we emailed you or mm, somewhere. We online? don't really like to share it. No, that's very fair. I was I'm being a bit nosy, but um, but thank but you. But if you sure. look under, um, uh, there are people in in the European tradition, 
In fact, many of the women who were herbalists, uh, midwives, psychologists, and seers <laughs> would see the same thing. So those, the, the concept is not, it's not just limited to us. The concept of ancestors goes way back in many traditions all over the world. And so I think there are people who can do this within, I imagine right here in, in Aurelia. Uh, I think the word is a major domo in the in the European tradition, the ones who transition people from this place to the to the other world. So there's you can go to school for it too. In Toronto. Thank you. Yeah. I recognize we are at our limit, our time limit, but I'm just wondering there are um, just kind of how many questions you might be willing to take or a few more. Um, okay, we'll take a few more. Thank you so much. The first question is, can Anishinaabe Bay tap into Mother Earth to teach us our language? Can you repeat that? Sure. So, can Anishinaabe Bay tap into Mother Earth to teach us our language? I used to think so. But the more that I, the more that I uh, work in that, and the more that I keep learning, the earth can teach us. But again, it's the language is from the earth. So all observable data in the natural world is explained in the language. R right down to the minutest details, our language is so precise that you can come to a pile of bare bear dung just fresh eating berries in the summer morning in August and it's just steaming and you can just describe in great detail how that that dung just sits there in a pile and it's steaming and it's so fresh it just falls over but um, will the earth tell us that I don't know I don't I don't know if it's possible but it could it's everything's possible everything is open for that uh, but again, that's why the language speakers are so critical. The, the men and women who are the hunters, the fishers, the gatherers, because they can explain in an amazing amount of detail all the guts inside the pickerel. You know, you cut open a fish and you got the floating stuff. You got the gizzards, you got the, all that. They, there's names and they identify all those pieces. And when you hear that, uh, in the language and, and working with those guts and they're all slimy and the scales and everything like that. You're working with all that in the language. It's like the amazing opportunity we need to. That's that's where the language has to be almost spoken and heard. So there's that relationship that's developed between the younger person and the one who's speaking that. That's so important to have. Otherwise, you're going to be I don't know. I, I imagine it can be that. Or, we don't know. We haven't run the test results on that stuff. So it's anything is possible. I hope. I mean, a lot of our children can't get out of a, a city. So then there's an opportunity. We have an opportunity to run our own metrics and our own uh, science on that. So that's as much as I can say about that. Thank you. Next question is in 400 years, 20 generations since contact, assimilation process is dominant throughout North America. What solutions do you present to manifest a symbolic relationship between Native and Western societies? What's symbolic? What can I make for that? A symbol. Well, it's been uh, oppression after oppression. Um, repression it's not been a very happy one but we're still here so as the world is encountering uh i think uh assimilation happens but we're doing it to ourselves i think that we've allowed ourselves to be uh putting uh something up there on a pedestal that says this is how you should be in this modern world you should have a job and you should have 
a, a Mercedes-Benz car and you should have a, a five bedroom home with three car garage and a couple dogs running around outside and you should have this a good job and all this. And I, I think that's a fallacy uh, to be just like us. And if you look at all the expansion, like I don't know if you noticed this, but Toronto's expanding like crazy. Everywhere you once went where there was fields of orchards and food, we now have massive housing complexes being built. So we're expanding, 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 expanding. I don't, I don't, um, I think there's limits to how far we can do that. Um, I don't, um, again, that's a complex question. What do I symbolize that relationship to be? Um, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that one. <laughs> I don't know if that helps them. They could always email me. My, my email's on there. I'll try to answer that. Last one. Thanks so much, yes, sure. Last one. So what are your thoughts of people who are not Indigenous embracing Indigenous tradition and culture? Raised in, repeat that. Sorry. What are your thoughts of people who are not Indigenous embracing Indigenous tradition and culture? Well, um, I belong to the powwow arena. My good friend for many years, he was a powwow dancer. He was a really good dancer. He had one of the most best outfits I've ever seen, like right down to the authentic fox, fox crow belt. It was a, crow, a certain style of belt worn on the plains, a crow belt. He grew up next to the reserve. His house literally was on the, on the border of the reserve. All of his friends were from the reserve, the, the uh, Winnebago tribe in Iowa. And uh, he, grew, he grew up living there next door to the community. He thought, and he was, he was like rudely awakened when he was like about 18. His parents told him, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not one of them. He grew up, thought he was, he thought he was uh, um, Winnebago. He could speak Winnebago. He could dance with the best of them. He danced with them. He went to every ceremony. He participated in everything. He spoke more Winnebago than some Winnebago people. I have another friend who was grew up, up in Northern Ontario. He too, <laughs> when he was like 17 or something, like that, he was, he was, his last name was the game. He why is my last name uh, this Italian name? He asked his father that. I said, well, you, you've grown up on the reserve all your life. You speak the language and you hunt like they do and you're just like them. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't, I, I have, those are my friends. So I've never seen them as anything different than other than human. And, but in terms of a whole society, I don't know if, uh, if Trudeau will embrace uh, indigenous traditions or I don't think everybody has to embrace and put on feathers and, and dance around like us to be to feel the earth and to feel what she's saying. Uh, I think there's some real fundamental human things that are just universal. So I, I don't know. Should you just all go out and buy a book and become how to become Indian or a native at this? At the, in one, uh, somebody should write a book like that, ten, uh, the book for dummies. You know, he got books for computers. You might as well have one for us. And, how to go to a powwow and fit in. <laughs> I, I just don't, I, I, it's, it's, you know, like in many communities, there's uh, uh, whole individuals who've been raised, who have been adopted by us into the community who are uh, from Scandinavia. We have a family in our community who are, who uh, are German and, and French. They've been raised in our community. They have Indian Act cards. And it's like that all right across the country. So uh, I guess at the bottom of it all, what's human is human. We're just practicing being humans. But yeah, good question though. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, let's give Nicholas a hand.
This is a very thought provoking talk and uh, I'm sure it's given us all something, many things to think about and uh, and those of us who are those of you who are listening, hopefully you're thinking some critical things, some new thoughts that you have not considered before, um, particularly around around what is intelligence and how intelligence is conceptualized, particularly indigenous intelligence is conceptualized by um, by the Eurocentric academe. And, uh, and also just as you were talking, it really brought to me um, just some thinking around how we seem to be distracted from the really important things mm -hmm. like Mother Earth and those priorities. And we seem to be often our different, uh, different directions that are, are not, well, are destructive. Mm -hmm. And so Chi Mi uh Marcy Cho for um, really bringing us back to these important insights. Really glad you're able to come in the middle of a snow squall that could be developing here, it certainly is, I think. And uh, we're just uh, so grateful on behalf of uh, the School of Social Work and our wonderful um, Social Work 4411 class in the audience. Just want to really express our gratitude. It's a real gift to have you here tonight. So miigwech. Mm -hmm. um, so it's my pleasure to uh, close the session and thanking everyone, of course, who um, attended our speaker series. And if, you're, um, if you would be interested in joining any future events, uh, please contact Mercedes Jaco. She's the Indigenous Initiatives Coordinator or check out the Lakehead University Indigenous Initiatives event webpage for upcoming events and speakers. Chimi Gwach, Marcy Cho, a big thank you to all.